The last few weeks I've had the joy of hosting uh, Pastor David Robinson here on Shabbat Night Live. Uh, he is the senior pastor of Freedom Hill Community in Missouri, and we are having such a wonderful time together. I ask if he would come back just one more time uh, because there are other things that... Uh, uh, you know, we, we get to spend hours and hours and literally days together uh, for a very short amount of time that we get to be on the air. And so many times I wish that we just had the camera rolling so that uh, so that people could participate in uh, some of the sweetest fellowship and in the in-depth discussions into the scriptures that, that we have enjoyed together here. And so I've asked David to come back. David, thanks for being it back so with us in Shabbat Night Live. Good to see you again, brother. Well, uh, Freedom Hill community, you are really uh, trying to step back into the faith once delivered to the saints, trying to develop community and right. not a church, not a congregation as we've known it. Because, um, you know, coming out of churchianity and you went from small churches and Gilead Baptist Church, I came from, you know, Green Corners Baptist Church, yeah, I mean, yeah. little, little churches. Yeah. And you went all the way up into the mega churches, over mm -hmm. 5,000 members and all. And in seeing that, you know, that, we may not know what it's supposed to look like, but we know what it's not supposed to look like Absolutely. because that's what we've been doing our whole life, that there has to be the power of God, the real life of the Spirit, that, that real intimacy that that people have with the Almighty and then can minister to each other. And this is what you're you're developing uh, in that community and working together, everyone working together to that that end. Absolutely. There's not anyone in our congregation that wants to 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 do the to follow the form or template that we've been given uh, in our modern day era of what the church looks like. We don't want to do that anymore because we've seen how it doesn't work and how it just builds a system uh, with a man at the top, and, and and it just puts so much pressure on that individual that he was never supposed to have, and we set pastors up to fail, and we just don't want to have anything to do with that anymore. Mm -hmm. And actually talking to a lot of other pastors, I see that they don't want to have anything to do with that either. So what's the answer? The answer is go back to the beginning. Go back in the book when the church was just formed, and look at how they actually did community. Mm -hmm. And so we are learning. We I, I by no uh, means say that we have this down pat. But I tell you what, if you have a heart to do something and you're united and you all are uh, in agreement and you walk in uh, agreement with each other, you can do anything and we desire to do that. We desire to, to be the hands and feet of our Savior, to go and, and spread the gospel to feed the sick, to, uh, to take care of the hungry, uh, or to take care of the sick, uh, to feed the hungry, uh, the orphans, the widows, and, and take care of ourselves. It even talks about taking care of the brethren. So mm -hmm, we actually mm -hmm. want to meet the needs of each other. But what you know, and you've seen it, our culture teaches you to be self-sufficient. Our culture teaches us to keep up with the Joneses, and it's even in the church. Because why? We're being conformed to our culture. Our culture's not being conformed to the church or mm -hmm. what God instituted as the church, mm -hmm. which is not right. a building, it's a living organism. Right. Correct. Mm -hmm. So what we have to do is we, had to we have to step back and go, what is wrong? And, and uh, like you said yesterday, I or last week, it was the Reformation. It was the Reformation. Mm -hmm. We want the, uh, This is the second Reformation. I think we have a great opportunity in this time and era to change what has gone wrong. We don't all have the answers, but let's try to do it right. How do we do it? We go back to the book. We yeah. go back to the book. We go back to the book and we see, well, uh, uh, Ananias and Sapphira didn't quite do it right. No. I mean, choosing uh, someone to take the place of Judas when Yeshua didn't tell him to do that, that didn't go quite right. We never Absolutely. hear that guy again. Exactly. And, you know, there, there's a lot of mistakes that are made along the way, but, you know, learning to walk by the Spirit and separate our own desires, our own emotions, and separate that from what the Spirit is really saying, you know, that's that is an ongoing thing. You, you have to put down uh, yourself and your self-interest in, in order to even hear the voice of the Spirit. Absolutely. And in my experience is when the Spirit speaks, it, it, I just can't remember ever being comfortable ever being something that I would want to do. Right, uh, right, right. So right. it's like, if you ever hear the Spirit tell you uh, to do something that you want to do, then you better question that Spirit because it's probably your own or that's right. uh, or a Spirit that's going to lead you down the path of destruction. That's exactly right. And one thing I learned, and, and, and I'm sure many people have, is I cannot walk in the will of God if I'm walking in my will. 
In other words, I have to be obedient to what God is saying, and I have to be willing to hit my knees and get off my own throne and put him on the throne and let him direct my life. Just like Abraham, when he called him out of his land, he left a very, uh, you know, very technological society of that time. I mean, it was not just, they weren't just living no. in cabins or mm -hmm. anything, but he went away to a land that he didn't even, had never seen or know because he trusted his Father in heaven. He trusted Yahweh. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's what happened. I finally came to the end of myself. I come from a very prideful uh, heritage, if you will, sports and everything. You know, you're a winner and you have to win. You have to win. And uh, very competitive. And I came to the end of myself. I had a time in my life where, where Yahweh enabled me by me pursuing Him. By me pursuing Him, doors open and you start asking questions, right? So by me pursuing him, I wanna be more like you, I wanna be more like you. And he says, well then get out of your will and get into mine. Just like Abraham did. When he said leave and go, get out of your will, go into my will. So mm -hmm. I had an opportunity for Yahweh gave me an experience. I actually was able to see myself as I really was. And I wept. Mm -hmm. And when he got me out of the way, when I allowed him to remove who I was on my throne, then I began to see the scriptures better. I began to see and questions began to come to me. And I knew as I pursued God, there's a greater, there's something greater than what I've been taught. This mm -hmm. just doesn't make sense. Yeah. And one of the greatest questions I had uh, was the, the three days. You know, uh, Yeshua died and was buried and was in the grave three days, three nights. And how, did this, how does that happen between Friday and Sunday? You know, that question hit me. And then it was other things. It was the dietary laws and, 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 and things like that. And, and I actually came to the conclusion that God knows more than I do. Mm -hmm. He yeah. just is smarter than yeah. I am. And um, as we began to pursue this, and it came through my wife, you know, she, uh, you know, I had to go on this, this journey of, of going, God, teach me, teach me. If I've been wrong all these years, teach me, show me this. It's, it's hard for a pastor to do, too. I mean, it he's is. the one that's supposed to have all the answers. And, uh, you know, and honestly, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the paycheck doesn't come from having all the answers. It comes from keeping the offering plates filled and everyone happy and, it does. and, uh, and you know, promulgating the denomination. It does. It puts pastors into more of a business mindset than it does into a pastoral mindset. I mm -hmm. mean, and it's a shame it's that way. And it's because the system's built wrong. It's mm. just wrong. And, uh, um, you know, our needs are met. All I care is for our needs to be met, you know, and, and Yahweh's providing our needs. Mm -hmm. uh, my Question hope everything. and joy. Yes. Question ev everything. <clears throat> absolutely. Um, so, you know, just being on this journey and coming to this place in my life, you know, I've been in this now for going on six years. I am a child. I am a, I'm still reprogramming uh, my brain from what I've been taught my entire life. Yeah, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, it's, yeah, and to be honest you. with you, it's, a, it's, a, it's quite mm -hmm. a joy, uh, you know, to see the new revelation, or n not new revelations, it's just the word being revealed to me mm -hmm. in the way yeah. that it was meant to be. So it's just been a joy to do this, you know, and, and I have questions and I'm asked questions all the time. And, and um, in fact, I, you know, I want to ask you questions, you know, if we have, can okay. I? <laughs> so the pastor's going to ask. The pastor's going to ask The pastor questions. ask instead of ask the pastor, is that yeah. what it is? Yeah, oh. I mean, if we can, I mean, if that's appropriate, because look, is that all right? Yeah, so yeah, 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 go I, fire, I, fire, fire away. I get I'm questions sorry. all the time. I get questions all the time, so I don't have answers for them. So what I do then is I go, you know what? I don't know, but let me see if I can find out. And, and then a lot of times I go online, you know, and I look at websites like uh, Snops, I think it is, Snops.com, Snoop, Snoop Snops. Snops, whatever it's called. <laughs> and I go on there and, and I go, okay, well, it says it's false. And one of them that just recently uh, that came up, and, and I want to ask you about this, uh, that there was an a email went out. I think I got it. I think many people got it. But it said that they found chariot wheels at the bottom of the Red Sea, Okay. Pharaoh's army, you know, was scattered and there's mm -hmm. bones and all this at the bottom of the Red Sea. So I thought, man, that is awesome. That's really cool. Now, did it really, did it change anything in my faith? No, it just makes me go, yeah, God. But it, it doesn't, I already believe. I don't need that. Mm -hmm. However, there are people that, you know, that helps them to see things like that. Now, then I go on this website and I look it up and it goes, nope, false, not happened. It never happened. That's all, you know, lies and there's no proof of it. Mm -hmm. and there's no archaeological discoveries. 
So I'm asking you, do you can you shed light on that? Oh, can you actually? Yeah. Well, 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 first of all, when you deal with Snopes, you have to realize, you know, it's just like a, an editor uh, for an encyclopedia. You're going to get their viewpoint. You're going to get their political views. And I'll, I'll tell you, Snopes is really twisted. Uh, I'll, g I'll give you an example. They had a picture of Obama's ring, and they uh, and this is a ring that he uh, he took off just long enough to hand it to his wife to give it back to him for his uh, wedding ring. Mm. And uh, being, you know, living in Israel, and, and I have uh, Muslim friends, I live in the old city, uh, there, there's probably not a street in the old city that I don't know people on. You know, wow. it's just, it's, it's, it's like my, my hometown. I really, and that's why I love take, uh, bringing people home with me to Israel for my tours. I don't go on a tour. I bring them home with me and introduce them to people that, you know, not because they're all right, but I'll introduce them to, uh, to Syrian Orthodox priests, uh, Aramaic scholars, uh, uh, you know, Orthodox Jews uh, across the board because I want them to get to know the viewpoints of different people. Not that they're right, it's just you have to know it in order to be able to communicate with, with these uh, individuals. And so, you know, I, I know the Bismillah. It, it is the, the most uh, iconic, uh, I, uh, iconic um, emblem of calligraphy that is done in the Muslim world, which uh, says there is no God but Allah. Mm. And that, that symbol for Allah, uh, which looks like a, a W, which is on Obama's ring, this this is a Muslim ring, uh, they say those are just squiggles. Those are not, that doesn't really say anything. And so it's immediately, no, you people are, are morons, <laughs> okay? You're trying to protect this guy that bows to Muslims, that, right. you know, who, who grew up as Barry Sotera, and just like Muhammad Ali, who was cash is Clay and Lou Alcindor, who turns into Kareem Abdul Jabbar, when they become Muslims, they change their na name to a Muslim name. Barack Hussein uh, Obama. He, he grew up as Barry Sotera. And, and oh, he, really? He, oh, yeah. yeah wow. Barry Sotera is his name. That. That's, a, yeah. that's what's on his, even on his fake birth certificate. Uh, but but uh, on this ring, and I'm looking at his snopes, and they say, yeah, those are just squiggles. And I say, yeah, right. Yeah, that, that, that has so much meaning that it's the ring he wears every day before he gets married. It takes it off just for a moment for her to put it back on his finger. You know, this, this guy's a flaming Muslim. But mm -hmm. yet... Because this is a political thing, they're going to say that. Now, the other thing, uh, now now on Snopes, they say they didn't find Pharaoh's chariots and army strewn on the bottom of the Red right, Sea. Right, right. That's, oh, that's what uh, I just uh, read. Fools, I mean. absolute fools. It was, uh, my goodness, well over 20 years ago that I first saw the first uh, video on this. Uh, this is something that was put out by the Prophecy Club, and it was um, a Ron Wyatt, who is an amateur archaeologist, who was doing this presentation, and it was filmed. And when I saw it, you know, it was like the eighth generation. You know, it was, it was a bad quality VHS. Like eight mil yeah, yeah, and, and it actually came from eight millimeter, millimeter right, film, right, right. and then and transferred. But I saw it, and I thought this really is compelling. This is great. And you know, where, where people say, "Well, I don't need to know that because uh, uh, you know I already believe." And I say, well, you idiot, your job <laughs> is to make other believers, make other disciples. Right. And if you don't need any evidence, if God has preserved something on the earth and you don't need it, that just tells me that you are, you're worthless. Mm. You're, 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 just, you're, breathe, you're breathing good air on the planet. Why don't you just check out? You don't need this. God preserved this on the earth and you don't want it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you, you, are, you are worthless, okay? You okay. Know, go, go sit in a church pew or something, all right? All right. Because we were sent to, to be bear witness and to give a testimony. And sometimes those testimonies, which you see in people's lives, people that were drug abusers, the sex offenders, murderers, just the most vile people, and then God enters their life. They turn their life over and Yeshua takes over their life and immediately changes them from the most disgusted, disgusting, wretched creature into someone who just desires to live a holy and a righteous and a God in life and just sells it all out for, 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 for God Almighty, that is a testimony. It is. It's evidence. Oh, yeah. And it's because of that that people believe. Well, when I saw this evidence, I had to get to the bottom. I had to know. I, you know, this, this was not something I was just going to leave because I thought this is the greatest tool that I've ever had in my life. This bears testimony that these scriptures, the, the, these words right here are true. You know, this is what we learn in the Baptist church. Mm -hmm. Every word is true. The ones that we don't believe, we just don't read. Mm-hmm.
That's right. A, that's the best. Skip over model. the chapters. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, well, we'll read uh, 1 Corinthians 13, but not chapter 12 or 14. No, uh, you got to skip 14. Yeah, yeah, you got to yeah. skip that here. No manifestation of the Spirit, no life in the Spirit, just just frozen, chosen, love each other. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, we, we, we know how to play the game, ladies and gentlemen, as, as, as pastors, teachers, we know how the denominational game is played. But when I saw this, I said, man, I've got a tool that can wake up the world. Right. And so I set out on a course to really dig into this and to find out. And because of that, I... I was divinely put in place of uh, uh, Jim and Penny Caldwell. They're the oil field engineer uh, and his wife and family that were uh, stationed in Arabia, northwest Saudi mm -hmm. Arabia, the oil fields of Midian, that was their world. And they were the ones that, that uh, brought out all the evidence over nine years, the photographic evidence, uh, the the uh, the artifacts themselves, all this that came out of Arabia for years, and uh, they actually got to put this video in the hands of Ron Wyatt. And I went, when I was there uh, visiting Ron once, uh, he showed me this video of the split rock. Now this is something that he didn't see at all. He was there, uh, but didn't see the split rock, which is about eight miles from Horeb. And, uh, and he showed this to me, and I said, Ron, where did you get this? Who are these people? And he said, I'll give you the video, but I will not tell you, and I can't tell you who these people are because their lives are in danger. Okay, wait, let me back up. So, so you saw the eight millimeter, the VHS films of, of it, and it was old and it didn't right, look really right. good. So now he's, other people went in and got better pictures. Right, I'm taking <clears throat> it all the way to Mount Sinai because, you know, I ended up in the home of Ron Wyatt <laughs> and working on the museum so I could be there day after day and to be with him because, you know, what I did, and you probably appreciate this because I know you're, you're a hunter, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, to make this trip to see Ron Wyatt, uh, and, and to, to go and to work on the museum. That's what I volunteered for. I prayed to God. I want to know, is Ron Wyatt telling the truth? Because I've got a, a, a three-inch binder full of anti-Ron Wyatt literature. People are sending it to me all over. Oh, he's a liar, he's a fraud. And I'm reading this stuff, and it's like I can see every one of these. They have a bend. And I do the research on the people writing this, and like this one guy, he's getting hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to look for Noah's Ark on Mount Ararat. Mount Ararat didn't even exist at the time of Noah. It's a 17,000 foot post-flood volcano, and everyone, everyone that says they found something brought back, they had all been exposed as frauds before. You know, bringing back pieces of the ark, and it was, no, it was a modern piece of wood that was cooked in, in uh, vegetable, or excuse me, fruit juice for weeks <clears> in an <throat> oven, and then they finally admitted that it was a fraud. And so, you know, the, the world is full of liars and frauds for different reasons, and I had to know, is this true? And so, to make this trip, I had to sell a, 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 a rifle that I, I searched for a decade to find. It was a, it was a Walther, a beautiful rifle. It took me a year, full, re, full restoration, and it's like, you know, this is a treasure. You only get one of these in your lifetime. Wow. And I took it to a pawn shop and sold it for $2,000. A pawn wow. shop. Yeah, when they saw it, they wanted it. And that was like my last treasure in life. And I said, I want one thing. I want to know, did, is Ron Wyatt, is he telling the truth or is he a liar? And did he find the Ark of the Covenant? And, and I was given an item, a revelation that, that he would have to confirm if he found the Ark of the Covenant. And so I went to see him, and that was the beginning of one of the most exciting eras of my life, because uh, when he started giving me this video evidence and said, I can't tell you where it came from, the people's lives were in danger, it was years later that I was uh, lecturing down, uh, I was actually on television, uh, and uh, the evening news down in um, New Orleans, uh, outside of New Orleans area, and um, uh, I, I did a, an event that night, and it was just jam-packed, just standing room only. Hundreds and hundreds of people literally standing. And, and at the end, uh, this couple came up and said, uh, Sir, where, where did you get these, uh, this video? Where did you get these uh, pictures of Mount Sinai? And I said, well, the archaeologist that, that uh, was there, he was captured and all of his evidence taken away, he gave it to me, but he said he would not and could not tell me where it came from because the people's lives were in danger. And the man looked at me and smiled and said, sir, that is the right answer because we are the people. 
We want you to our house wow. for the Sabbath tomorrow because everything that we have is yours to help get this message out. Wow. Because he knew that I was giving an accurate record of that very thing. And so it was after this point that uh, uh, out of Karolinska Institute, the head marine biologist there, uh, that took the most modern research vessels down there, underwater ro robotic dive cameras, and literally drives those sleds down, uh, down in the Red Sea uh, among, uh, it's literally a graveyard of Egyptian chariots down there. It's an underwater battlefield of Egyptian chariots that are covered with coral down there, uh, forming the exact image of what was there originally. Uh, uh, one of the, the wheels was taken to the Department of Antiquities in Cairo. Mohammed Nassif Hassan, who was the, uh, the, the head of the Department of Antiquities, walked up to the table where this piece of coral was sitting and immediately identified it to what dynasty it was, you know, because that is the dynasty that had that, uh, that particular chariot wheel. Uh, immediately recognized recognized it. Uh, when I did my series on the Red Sea crossing, I was down there a lot and I interviewed so many <coughs> boat captains down there because I would, wanted to rent a boat in order to tell the story and get out on the, on the, uh, the Yom Suf, the, mm -hmm. the ancient uh, you know, Red Sea or, or Yom Suf in Hebrew. And in a, a one a boat after another, the captain was bringing up, bring, showing me photographs of chariot parts down there. Oh yeah, we, we've been down there several times. They don't let us stop over there anymore. They won't but, let them go and look anymore. Right, right. And no one can bring up any artifacts from that area. Why is that? I mean, why? Uh, because it's, it's, well, there are gunships that run both ways on that. And this denies the story of Egyptology. See, Egyptology denies that Israel was ever there, that there was ever a pharaoh and his army that went down in the river. So if they go down there and pull this up. Yeah, right. It, it just, it, everything they are teaching is a lie. Right, right. It doesn't line and, up. And all of Egyptology is based on the historical record. It's not really historical. It's a fairy tale made up by uh, Matthew, which... Uh, uh, th this is at the time that uh, Ptolemy Philadelphus, a, a, Sir, a, a Greek general, uh, went in and took Egypt and, he's, and also Israel. And he said, I want a history of your people. So what did he, uh, Israel do? They had 70 rabbis, scholars, take the Torah and translate it into Greek and said, here's our history. Hmm. What did Egypt do? One Egyptian priest who made up a fairy tale for 30,000 years gods ruled Egypt. For another 30,000 years, men and gods ruled Egypt, and then for 30 dynasties, men ruled Egypt. The two oldest copies vary in the names of kings and pharaohs by more than 1,500 name variation. In other words, the Egyptians didn't even bother copying this correctly because they know it's a, it's a fairy tale. I mean, a second grader, knows this is a fairy tale, 30,000 years God's ruled Egypt. Oh yeah, right, mm. okay. And Superman and Batman, you know, they, they're in Mortal Kombat. You know, in other words, the, the Egyptians don't even treat it, but yet this is what modern Egyptology is based on and this is what they use to disprove or claim that the Bible isn't true. Right. And so, uh, so when it comes uh, down to this, uh, uh, the, the, the Red Sea crossing, the evidence is there. There have been so many people that have been down there. Uh, I know the people that have uh, been divers down there uh, that have uh, been down there. They've handled the parts. Um, uh, you know, they're, they're, out of Europe, there have been several people on it. So for Snopes, whatever they say about it, you know, there's guys that, that, that sit at their computer and uh, you know, have, have no idea what's going on in the real world, right. but they have their political agenda. Just like saying, oh yeah, these are just squiggles on Obama's ring, that's why I brought it out. They have their political agendas, and don't, don't worry, you're not gonna get the truth all the time, you're gonna get whatever the political agenda is for that. Wow, wow. so those things, the reason though, so what you're saying is the reason those things haven't been extracted, the reason that we as the church or the believers don't get to see this evidence uh, firsthand, or pictures, you know, or it's on a TV show or anything, is because of the Egypt Egyptian government, because they do not want them to Right, as far this. as bringing up the evidence from it. But the evidence, as far as recorded evidence, it's abundantly available. Uh, I did a series on uh, the the red, uh, excuse me, the real Mount Sinai, and mm -hmm. uh, the Sinai connection is what I call it. It's four and a half hours presenting all the evidence of the chariots on the bottom of the Red Sea, and then taking you to Mount Sinai and showing 
showing all the evidence there. Okay. And, and I'll give you an example, <laughs> uh, a, a beautiful example, is that um, Josias, who is the head of the Israeli Department of Antiquities, which is just a co-word for the Rockefeller Museum. Rockefeller put all the money into this. When you walk in the front door, you're gonna see an artifact, a human artifact from 33,000 years ago, which immediately tells you we're living in a fairy tale world. Right. The, you know, we haven't been here 33,000 years, but this is the fairy tale world that they try to promulgate, evolution and all that. And so Josias refused to look at the physical evidence that was smuggled out of Arabia at the nearly the cost of the lives of the people, the video evidence, the high resolution photographs, the satellite photographs of the area, everything that was done. I mean, you know, NASA uh, with, with uh, James Irwin, the, the moon astronaut got involved with this thing as well. Wow. And he refused to look at the evidence. He said, Mount Sinai is a literary invention. No one will ever find it. That was his statement. Without refused looking at the evidence. to look at the evidence because he said the Bible is a fairy tale. Mount Sinai is a literary invention, it's a fairy tale. Josias is a complete moron, mm. okay? He's a highly paid political moron. You know, he's a whore, he'll say anything in order to keep the system going that he's a part of. But you know, that's basically what we find in, in a lot of pastors. They're just keeping the system going because that's where the paycheck comes from. And, and they, they know nothing about the facts of the Bible. They, they, they've they never studied it. They've studied what it takes to keep their denomination going. And they've learned that, you know, you tell the people, you know, stand up, stay, stand up, sit down, put it in a bulletin, exactly what you're supposed to do. This is the time you give your offering. If you've got questions, uh, uh, don't come here, mm. and we don't need your problems. We don't. We don't need you asking questions. That's why I'm glad to, to have a pastor asking me these questions. Hey, yeah. um, uh, <laughs> I, I know I've been on for a little bit, <laughs> no, but okay. they're just it's telling okay. me that no, I, I got a lot. To, you know I what? I got stop. a lot of questions. Well, we got to okay, stop. Okay, I, I got to stop here for just a minute, questions later. ladies and gentlemen. Uh, they, they make me do this because they tell me that they have to pay the internet bill and the lights and the camera and all of our staff. We have so many staff that have children and every donation to A Rude Awakening helps to feed hungry children. The children of our staff. Because if you don't give, then their little babies go hungry. No, literally, ladies and gentlemen, it takes a great amount of money to reach out around the world to do this. Broadcast television and internet, what we're doing, it's not free just because you can pay your internet bill, okay? It is, we are freely giving because we are, are commissioned by Yeshua. He said the gospel of the kingdom that he is preaching not some kind of made up fairy tale gospel, no sloppy agape greasy grace gospel, no, the one that he was teaching, he said, you make disciples, you teach them what I teach you. That's what we're doing. We are reaching out to you because others have helped us find you. Whenever you're hearing this, you have now got two minutes and I need you on the phone, I need you standing with me because it's now your responsibility to sow seed to reach somebody else who also has a hunger for truth, a hunger for righteousness. If you've been ministered to, then you need to step up and be a part of this. Join us because your reward is on the sea of fire and glass when the smoke clears.
Welcome back. We are with David Robinson, the senior pastor of Freedom Hill Community. And this has really turned into a segment on the pastor asked. David, you I, said you've no, got No, I more. like that. I got questions and I got cuz I get hit with these questions all the time. So I love getting other leaders' views or their answers to these questions. And so, you know, I think it's kind of, yeah, this is kind of fun. So can we just- yeah, Go ahead, right. fire, fire I'll, away. <clears throat> I got a question too. All right, like I told you, when I came out, when I was in, <clears throat> probably one of the questions after my wife came back and she had all the answers, you know, uh, you know, and, and I'm sitting there going, <laughs> what? Um, but uh, one of the things was, you know, I started asking it years ago, but then it, I, re, I, I went back to it and it was the three days, three nights. Three days, three nights. And, and, and I think I know the answer to that, but I want to get your answer to that because it does not make logical sense. If, he, if what we teach in the, in the church, especially, in, I know in my Baptist church it was thought this way, he died on Friday and, and rose on Sunday. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's not three days, three nights. Uh, yeah, Einstein couldn't get three days and three nights no. between Good Friday no, no, no. and Easter Sunday. And, uh, and a part of the problem comes from... Uh, this, even though we have the, the Gospels, we have in English, they come from most of them. Uh, the translations came from Greek, but this is not a Greek culture. This is a Hebrew culture that is uh, based on the biblical reckoning of time, the biblical Hebrew calendar that was in place in the temple mm -hmm. period. And so, um, you know, days began at sunset. And and so when we we read this, we have to understand it from the context of the people who wrote it. That's why I say, let Jews interpret the scriptures the Jews wrote, mm -hmm. and uh, we leave plenty of time for the Gentiles to interpret all the scriptures they wrote which is less than three seconds. Right. Okay? So, uh, the most repeated prophecy in the Gospels, Yeshua says this more than any other thing, that there's gonna be one sign, and only one sign of his authenticity. One sign that you have the true Messiah. It is the sign of the prophet Jonah. Jonah was three days and three nights in the great fish's belly, whale, King James. So he would be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth and raised on the third day. Shaul, Paul also said this, uh, that, that according to the scriptures, he was uh, in the grave three days and three nights and raised on the third day. Right. And there's just no way you can get it between Dagon, fish god Friday, mm -hmm. And Easter, the Babylonian sex god is Sunday. Those are two high days uh, on the pagan sun god worship calendar. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, once you try to wrap three days and three nights around the twist that, that around pagan holidays, you're going to end up with, with big trouble. And one of the problems that come up is says that they, they needed to get those who are on the cross, when they needed to get them down off the cross before sunset. Before sundown, because mm -hmm. before the Sabbath. Right. Okay? And so we know it's just before Sabbath. Then it says, for that Sabbath was a high Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Well, any Jew knows what that's talking about because right. the, the day that the Passover lambs are sacrificed, that's a work day. It is mm -hmm. the 14th day of the month. They are then put in the oven before sunset because that sunset is the 15th and that begins the high Sabbath that begins the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the right. Feast of Matzah. And so, and every feast begins with a high Sabbath and ends with a high Sabbath and it does not matter what day of the week it falls on. If you Yom Kippur, for instance, a high Sabbath falls on a Tuesday. It's a Sabbath. It's a high Sabbath. Absolutely. And that particular year, at sunset, on Wednesday, that began the high Sabbath. Okay. And, and so we know exactly what year it was. There's no question about it. Once you get rid of the fairy tale that Eusebius invented of the three and a half year ministry, and that was invented more than 300 years after the resurrection of Yeshua, the, he came up with this harebrained idea. I mean, it was pure idiocy. Okay, I want to hear more about this. So let's just let's go there. Okay, so he. Okay, okay, so who well, is he, and what? Did, what did, okay, well, 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 let me let me first get okay. the three days and all three right, nights. Right. So he's in the grave just before sunset. He's in the grave all Thursday night because. You count, begin counting at night, and to be right. raised on the third day means you have to start counting with the night. Right. That's the only way you can do it. It's biblical reckoning of time. Mm -hmm. He's in the grave all Wednesday night, Thursday night, and all Friday night. He's in the grave all day Thursday, because Wednesday night at sunset, all day Thursday is the high Sabbath. He's in the grave all day Friday, and all day on Saturday, the Sabbath, and raised on the Sabbath before sunset, because sunset begins the day of the first fruit 
and the first fruit Jesus, offering. Right. And so then, uh, after his resurrection, then those others who were in the graves that were marked, they arose and appeared to men in the streets of Jerusalem, and it was done at the time that the priest went over and harvested the ten standing omer right. of barley right. on the side of the Mount of Olives, far away from the, uh, the the crucifixion and the grave of Yeshua. And it was then that Yeshua presented them in the temple in heaven the next morning. That's why the scripture says when he, they, the women came to the grave, Miriam first, mm -hmm. Early the first day of the week, it is still dark and the grave was empty. When did he get up? The fourth night? No, the third day on the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. So they come and the grave's already empty and and she goes to grab him by the feet. He says, don't touch me. I've not yet ascended to my to father my in heaven. Then he tells her, go tell my disciples that I now ascend to my father and their father, my God and their God, and then to meet me in the Galilee. He, as the high priest who has been in seclusion, who cannot be touched with hands, and this is part of the, the temple system, this rehearsal was put in place by David. Then he takes those first fruits who are then presented before the, the Father's Father. throne in heaven, and that's why in the book of Revelation we have the 24 elders. Right. Ezekiel doesn't see 24 elders. 24 elders are not seen before in the throne room until that. These are not angels, and they're 24 elders. So we have to remember, angels are not dead people. Only in Mormonism do they get that one so messed up, okay? Mm -hmm. Dead people are dead people. Angels are angels. People never become angels. Angels are messengers. They don't have wings, and as far as we see in the scriptures, they don't even sing. Right. And so, you know, we, we need to get back to what the scripture says on that. So there we have three days and three nights, and he is uh, raised on the Sabbath, and the next morning he, as the high priest, presents the first fruits in the Father's throne in heaven, and is back down on the earth. The other women who bring the burial spices, they are turned away by the angel. He's risen. Yeshua meets them, and it says they take him and grab him by the feet. Yeah. They're allowed to touch him because he's already been in the Father's throne, already come back down to the earth and see the whole pictures there in the scripture. But if we do not understand the Feast of the Lord as these prophetic shadow pictures that were put in place in the temple liturgy by the prophet David who saw beforehand the coming of the Messiah, he put these things in place and Yeshua fulfilled them to the very day, the very hour, the exact moment. And that is the, the beauty uh, of the, the first four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, show Yeshua fulfilling the spring feast, all these rehearsals, then the fifth gospel, the book of the Revelation, shows the Messiah as the conquering reigning king, the eternal judge who fulfills the fall feast mm -hmm. of the Lord. It is all about the feast of the Lord. And the feast of the Lord are all about Yeshua, the Amen. prophet, the promised Messiah. <laughs> That's really good. Now, we went back and you, you, you told me to let, me let you finish, but you talked about that something was interpreted wrong by... Um, Oh, Eusebius. In Eusebius, yeah, he, what was that again? Yeah. Okay. Where the three and a half year ministry fabrication came up, where, where it uh, uh, emerged on the scene was Eusebius, who was the court bishop of Constantine, the former bishop of, of uh, Caesarea, right on the, the, the coast of Israel. And he was the court bishop of Constantine. And he wrote in his, uh, in his uh, work, on the oration and exaltation of the Emperor Constantine. This is, in, in that work, he wrote, and first of all, if we're gonna extol the virtues of the Emperor Constantine, <coughs> we already know that we are extolling the virtues of somebody who is a, a complete biblical illiterate. He was a worshiper of Mithra, the Roman sun god, who was born on December 25th. Uh, he brought in all this Babylonian sun worship and mixed it into his new church state religion, uh, in which you know the, it, it, Christianity became the religion of state by the stroke of a pen, and nobody mm -hmm. had to change change anything. Instead of praying uh, to Mars, they now are going to pray to St. Martin. Mm -hmm. You know, we're just going to change the names a little bit. We're going to keep doing the same thing. Easter, the Babylonian fertility goddess, we're going to have her day as a resurrection. The, the whole nine yards. It's just a bastardized version of a religion that's kind of based on the Bible a little bit. Right. That's, what, that's what the Roman religion is all about. But it was, uh, it was this uh, uh, Eusebius who said that Jesus' ministry was three and a half years, which is one half of a week. I'm quoting him. Yeah. Since when is three and a half years one half of a week? 
it immediately tells anyone that's a student of the Bible that he's referring to the prophecy that appears in, in the ninth chapter of Daniel, the 70-week prophecy or 77's prophecy, 70 Shavua uh, prophecy. And, and because it, it talks about there being 70 weeks and, uh, and there's seven weeks, 62 weeks, after 62 weeks, one week in the midst of we the week, all these the, these coded things that the angel Gabriel gives him in his simple question, is the 70 years of our exile almost up? That was the question. And the angel was sent back with this cryptic prophecy that is absolutely incredible that gives us the, from the day that is recorded in, in Ezra chapter seven, it's the first day of the first month in the seventh year of the reign of Artaxerxes. That is the first day of the month of the Aviv. Mm -hmm. We got the very day in the seventh year of Artaxerxes, which is 457 BCE. We go seven sevens of years, 49 years, until the Zerubbabel's temple is built. Then we go an additional 62 sevens of years for a total of 69 sevens of years. It brings us to Aviv 127 <coughs> of the Common Era, the day Yeshua crossed over the, the Jordan, Jordan River, River, and John said, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Exactly 69 sevens of years, 483 years to the day, and it is recorded in the Scripture. That, that very thing. So Eusebius, however, he's got to get all of Daniel's prophecy completely fulfilled. Because as, uh, remember what Yeshua said, until heaven and earth pass away, one jot, God one tittle will not pass away till all is fulfilled. Mm -hmm. That was his key. He's got to get all Bible prophecy fulfilled. He's got to get all of Daniel's 70 weeks fulfilled. So he's got to have Daniel's, Jesus' ministry has got to be three and a half years, and he's going to take three and a half years out of the book of Acts to get it all fulfilled so that now Constantine can reign from his millennial throne in Rome as the vicar of Christ. Wow. That's what it's all about. And the three and a half year ministry was concocted so that the, so that Constantine and his papal successors can be almighty God upon the earth and, and, and wield the sword of judgment and kill millions of people, anyone who does not agree with him because he is Christ on earth, right. the vicar of Christ. And if you cross him, if you hold anything in opposition to what he has mandated from the Holy See, you'll be executed. I mean, the, the Western, excuse me, the Eastern Church was just decimated. They, they, they murdered millions of people who refused to follow the Pope. Right. And, and, and so that's why we as Baptists grew up with a three and a half year ministry because, you know, we we are, honestly, we are, we are simply protesting Catholics. Yeah. You know, we just never stepped away from it. Uh, basically, everything we do, the Christ, you know, in, in, in America, you, you know this, mm -hmm. it was illegal in America. If you had your church doors open on Christmas Day, right. the pastor would be put in jail, yeah, right, right? Right, yeah. What was it, up uh, 1860s? I right, right, that. I think 1863, right, yeah. right through there. And it's like, because they knew this is Babylonian sun worship. Mm -hmm. They knew that this is what we were fleeing Europe. We're getting away from the, 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 the Pope and the, and the crown who rules by divine right. Right. You know, representation, I mean, uh, taxation without right, representation. Right, right. You know, you obey my rule because God Almighty put me here. All that nonsense that we, we've kind of taken that position <laughs> in the church, haven't we? Absolutely. You know, yeah. oh, I, I am the anointed. You know, you have to listen to me. You have to submit to me everything I say. Oh, don't touch the Lord's anointed. You ain't the Lord's anointed. You're down at the bottom of the heap. You're supposed to be absolutely. serving everyone else. You're not the king. Hey, There's one king. Absolutely. You are dirt absolutely. compared to him. Absolutely. I totally agree with that. And he just... He kind of shows how we have conformed. And this is an example. Conformed. It was illegal until 1873, right? And then all of a sudden, 63. what happened? Yep. 63. Yep. And then what happened? What happened? Well, now we've got a phallic symbol, the penis of Ra, decorated with his gold and silver testicles in front of our churches. Oh, well, after we go under the steeple, which is a phallic symbol. Right, right. You know, this is like, what is the, the, the devil's penis doing on top of the building where the body of the Messiah is supposed to meet? Right. Why do we have his... his genitalia? Per, yeah, genitalia <laughs> in front of our churches. Yeah. I mean, this is insanity, people. Yeah. It's like, talk about clueless, and this is the generation we're living in now. 
Where is the call to holiness, righteousness, hating what God hates, loving what he loves, and doing what he said? I don't do these abominations. Keep a feast to me three times a year, and I'll tell you how to do it, because they are prophetic shadow pictures of that which is good to come. It'll show you about the Messiah, and so what happens, people read the Gospels, they don't even know that Yeshua is fulfilling the spring feast. They're so clueless. Right. It's never and been why? Taught. Because we went to Bible school so that we would learn the Bible, and what did we learn? How to promulgate our religion, which is Babylonian sun worship that we got from Constantine. Three yeah. and a half year ministry, what a joke. I've actually had friends that were actually in Bible school. Uh, I had this one very close friend that called me and, go, and actually said to me, he goes, I, I, I know this is wrong. I know this is wrong, but I, I have to, I go, look, you don't have to agree with it. This was before I came into my you know, awareness. Mm -hmm. Awakening, but you already knew. <laughs> yeah, that there, there's. But he's like, things. and I go, yeah, that's, yeah, that doesn't make sense, or that just seems wrong. And he's like, but to get my degree, I have to do this. But what happens even then, most of the time, is is you go ahead and you get your degree, and you just fall into the cattle trough, you know, or the the path of everybody well, else. And you know, you just th go this and, is what I, what I wanted to uh, talk about this because, see, uh, coming from a, an independent Baptist church, the pastor's hired, and if he doesn't kowtow to what the elders say, he is gone. gone. He is out of there. Right. So he has no freedom. Right. You know, they're, they, they, and, and so that's good for reason because that way, you know, there's a group of people holding him accountable mm -hmm. so the heresy doesn't take off. Absolutely. But also it keeps the truth from coming out because they want to hold it and keep everything going because their grandfather started this, their name is on the pew. Absolutely. We want everything to go on the way it always has. Don't stir things up. You know, you know, uh, you know, whatever their party lines, they hold that. Now we come to what has happened in America. Oh, we don't want to be accountable. We're going to start our own ministry. We're right. going to have a real passion for truth or whatever, and we're going to get out there and, and 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 start our own thing. And I'm going to be the king of this thing. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. And you know, it turns into a a person who then builds himself his own Nicolaitan hierarchy by bringing people under him. That oh, hey, you know, if I can convince him that yeah, hey, you come under me and you can be my worship leader, and in a few years you can get a big paycheck and and uh, all this stuff, and you start sucking these people into this, and because of their own, their, their own avarice, they want to get in, and so they keep building him up because they figure how high he is, and he's drawing them up in there, and so it builds this monstrosity until you, you end up with somebody who's insane, yeah. literally insane. Yeah, I, I actually ran into this in Tennessee where yeah, we, we decided to visit because of our kids. You know, we decided to visit this little church because, you know, we were an hour from where, uh, well, probably 30 minutes from where um, we had originally gone to church, and we just wanted to be a part of the community. It was a real small Nazarene church, and we started going there. And what we found out immediately it was a family church. Hmm. And you know, <laughs> we thought, you know, you know what? You go to church, you get built up, and and one of the things I believe is I love it when people go, you know what? I really feel like God's sending me here. Go. Go, but most people go, well, no, 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 you gotta stay here, this is your church. No, we should be training people to go out and to, mm -hmm. and to train others and disciple right. others. Mm -hmm. And um, so we thought, you know, we've been we've really been built up and let's, let's go minister to the local community. So we went to this small church and we found out really quickly, they like things just like it is. Because we started, it started growing, the youth started, you know, just really igniting and, and, and getting excited about, you know, their faith and, Mm -hmm. And then immediately you felt the pinch of like, uh, no, 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 We're, we don't mm -hmm. want that. We yeah. don't want this. Uh -huh. and, that. and then it, literally at some point we just finally wiped the dust off our feet and, and we left. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. you hit it right on the head. This is, that's the system. We want things just like we are. And when you come in as a pastor, you have to follow what we desire you to do. You have to do it this way. And we're going to call you out if well, the Spirit's leading me in a spiritual way to do this and the, no, we're not gonna do that. We're not gonna do that because we don't feel that. So the pastor is governed, you know, why do you said it early? His paycheck, his paycheck, you know, he has to do what is, he's told to do mm -hmm. or otherwise he doesn't get a paycheck. Right. Just the whole thing. the opposite end, if you build your own kingdom, you can <clears throat> put yourself into an unlimited paycheck. Absolutely. And to what where a, you we, can, yeah, live in a million dollar place 
We talked about a couple of weeks ago that without accountability, there's got to be accountability. And it can't be it can't be employee accountability. It can't be people that are on staff. It can't be people that are, you know, paid. Um, you know, it has to be outside accountability. The people that, other than the fact that because of the way our, our board at Freedom Hill set up, there's that accountability immediately and there's that oneness of unity and we make decisions together. Mm-hmm. Then, and, and, and I can, in, in, in doing that, they look at me for the spiritual, I mean, you know, I really feel like the Lord's leading us to do this and so forth and they listen to me, but we still, we do things together. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. and, and, yeah. and, and that's what it's, that's what it's supposed to be. But for us, my wife and I, Diana, <clears throat> our accountability, personal accountability is outside of the church. Mm-hmm. We have people in our lives that are watching us and are telling us exactly what they see and, and we run things by them and ask their opinions because we look at them as, as uh, spiritual mentors. You know, so it's, accountability is the key. And, it, and we just don't have that anymore. Yeah, yep. I hear you. So. And, any other questions from, uh, from, from from the pastor here? Well, you know what? We've if got we got just a few minutes left few here. Minutes. Okay, I got one. Let's see. What was I going to ask you about? Oh, the Temple Mount. The Temple Mount. Now, you, you, you hear that the Temple Mount's not really the Temple Mount. Wait, that's really just a Roman army parade ground because of the stones, the whole stones being stacked oh, on top of you. Do you have time oh, to go into oh, that? Oh, I really oh, want to know this. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Ernstwein, who is a professor of mine, he, he came up with this harebrained idea that, uh, well, I, I call him an over-literalization. Uh, that, that's where he got into his error. Over-literalization of English text of the Bible. And uh, when uh, this is the, the thing that he concocted. Uh, Yeshua said there's not going to be one stone left on top of another. This whole thing is coming down. Speaking of the temple in Jerusalem, mm-hmm. this is uh, Matthew chapter 24. Uh, 23, uh, you know, he's storming off the Temple Mount just two days before Passover after completely the scathing rebuke. You know, you whitewashed sepulchers, you you worthless, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is, uh, I mean, at that point, they said before before this final message, they said, we're not going to take him at Passover. We don't want to cause trouble. Right. After that, no, they're going to kill him and they're going to do it as fast as they can. All right. So he storms off and he said, you're not going to see me again until you say Baruch Habab Hashem Yahovah. And he storms off the Temple Mount. His disciples say, oh, Lord, look at this fantastic. Isn't that a beautiful cornice up there? Look at the workmanship. He said, yeah, boys, it'll take a good look at it because there's not going to be one, one stone left on yeah. another. This whole thing is coming down. They shut their mouths. They didn't say another word until they got all the way over on the side of Mount of Olives. And there are only three of them there. Wow. And this is Matthew 24. Three disciples that get to hear what he talks about here. But this, not one stone left on another. This is what Ernst Martin came up with. Because there's still one stone left on top of another, this can't be the Temple Mount. I Uh, say, no, Ernst, that's stupid. This is a retaining wall, okay? Right. This is a retaining wall. The Temple, there is not one stone left on another, literally. Right. In another place, he speaks of Jerusalem, there's not gonna be one stone left on another. I can take you to the burnt house, which is a priest's quarters, completely destroyed, but yet there's still stones left on top of another. See, there's a difference between figures of speech. You know, you say the dry is thirst, the, the ground is dry, mm-hmm. statement of fact. The ground is thirsty, that's a figure of speech. There is no faculty of thirst that the ground has, but it paints a, a more clear picture. They are figures of speech. There are over 240 figures of speech in the Bible, okay? Mm-hmm. Well, that one stone left on top of another speaks of utter destruction and desolation, but if to fulfill it, there can't be one stone left on another, then that hasn't even happened yet. Right. So what it is is an over-literalization that Ernst Martiner got, got into, and so he says that any place that there's one stone left on top of another, the temple could never have been there. Well, that is one of the most ignorant statements I could believe. I mean, you know, this guy actually taught in Bible school and and wrote books. But, you know, some of his his conclusions were just plain stupid. Mm. And and that was one of them. And so then he came up with this whole idea that the Temple Mount was actually a Roman parade ground. Yeah, my bad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and now we've got people in the so-called Hebrew Roots movement, and the word movement really belongs in the bathroom on this one. People that have no biblical education at all, no historical background, they go over to Israel on a little visit with a tour guide, and now they think they're a professional because other people are listening to them. People with absolutely no sense and no understanding of the Bible at all go over to Israel 
Israel and listen to them, and then they start mouthing this same kind of stupidity. But yet we're given the, the, the details about the gates. Uh, and, and actually, in the, um, uh, I have, uh, on several occasions, I go to the rabbis, and I go to the Temple Treasures Institute, and I have corrected them on some of the paintings that are done in there according to the ancient text and show them that these paintings are wrong, and they've agreed, and they have actually changed some of the paintings that, that now appear in this book. Mm. And because we have details about the gates uh, and, and the southern steps and different things about the Temple Mount, that was not a Roman parade ground. Right. That was the brainstorm of a guy that, that, that taught for Ambassador College. And then Ken Klein, who is a football player, picked up on this. And other people that, 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 that really should not be listened to. They shouldn't, even, uh, you know, they, they shouldn't even be out there talking because they have no background in the Bible. Mm -hmm. They've never studied history. They're not historians. They're not Bible scholars. You know, they, they, they are just out there in building their own kingdom of Idiots. I mean, you know, they, they're forming the League of Morons out there. And, and it, you know, it's very upsetting to, to see people who will, will destroy any real historical documentation. As a matter of fact, I took Ernst Martin's book uh, to the head rabbi on the uh, Temple Treasures Institute. I, I stayed up all night and read it. Uh, someone gave it to me and said, uh, uh, you know, if one-tenth of this is true, it changes everything. I saw him the next morning after staying up, and I said, you're right, if one-tenth of this are true, it would change everything. There's not one thing in here that's true. It's all based on a fairy tale wow. of over-literalization of an English text. This guy has no background. He, doesn't, he shouldn't even be writing this book. Doesn't know Hebrew? Uh, no, no. I, I took it to the, the head rabbi, and I said, what did you think about this book? And he said, I wouldn't dignify that with an answer. And then he turned away, and, did something, and I asked him another question. He turned around and just looked at me. Oh, I get it. You're not going to dignify it with an answer. You're not even going to open your mouth. This is too stupid to even have a conversation about. I, I agree. I agreed with them. But this is the kind of thing. People have to be very careful because the Hebrew roots thing is the next cash cow for a lot of people. This is their opportunity to do something new because they couldn't make it in the, the own world that they had. Maybe they got sick and tired of their, their religion in, in their Baptist church or whatever. And I say Baptist because we were, okay? But, but yeah, that doesn't give you the right to go in and, and claim the title rabbi Right. When, when you are not. Right. It doesn't give you the, the, the authority to steal from, uh, from other people who have spent their life in this, and you just come on the scene because you decide you want to be famous and teach the Torah because nobody even knows what the word Torah means. Right. That's what, that's what we're, we're dealing with now. And so, you know, I'm not a part of the Hebrew Roots movement. That's a movement that, that, that is just full of, of crazies. Mm -hmm. I think it's time to get back. Let's get back to the faith once delivered to the saints. That's good. Hey, I think they told me I ran out of time a long time ago. Thanks for being with us. David, thanks. It's, it's been, been a, a pleasure, brother. Heaven. It's been a pleasure. And uh, <laughs> we'll let the pastor pastor next time. And uh, uh, thanks for being with us. We'll see you next time. Shalom. Peace. Bye-bye.